welcome and thank you all for attending tonight book to action talk um i'm ahmad mirza i'm the librarian here with the santa barbara public library um before we begin just do some little housekeeping here um just want to take a few moments uh to say that if you've registered for the event on the library's calendar um, you should get an email with the webinar information the zoom link um, and if you're placed on the wait list and this was a very popular one i even think it might have went to the wait list um, still register because uh, we do send out the link on the day of the event. So if it's full, sign up, you could still get in. Um, upcoming talks, up to, up, upcoming trail talks that are coming up. Um, we have one that's next week. That's Thursday, June 16th. Ah, oh, brilliant. James, thanks for this one. <laughs> uh, the next one uh, is Thursday, June 16th. Uh, building a comprehensive trails plan for Santa Barbara County. Uh, where, what, how, and who and that is with Ray Ford. So that's again, Thursday, June 16th, a week ago today at this time. And then we also do have the July trail talks on the calendar already. Also, that's July 21st. If you want to mark your calendars for that one, it's all also on our library calendar on our library website. Um, you could register for that as well. Um, and that one is the Tahoe Rim Trail Overview and Sustainable Trail Use. And that's going to be with Morgan Steele and Tommy Rosenbluth, um, that's, a, that's a Tahoe one. So that's gonna be really cool to get you know that, but both talks, upcoming talks are gonna be great. We're really excited for that. Um, uh, also, I want to say that if anyone's uh, watching this from the audience and has any questions during the presentation, uh, so please, please, please put them in the chat. Um, if we have time at the end, and we usually have some time at the end, we try to get to your questions. Um, so if you add anything that pops up, um, just go ahead and put it in there. We'll and we'll try to and we'll try to get to it. Um, this presentation will be recorded, and we plan to put it on the library's YouTube page, um, which is again, it's a good thing for you to register, even if uh, you are on the wait list, because we still send a link out to everybody once it gets on the YouTube. We link we send the links for the YouTube uh, recording of this presentation, and also the uh, uh, links to register for the other two. There'll probably be two talks on that one. So the the Ray Ford talk. Um, next week and then the, the Tahoe Rim Trail talk that's happening in July. Um, so now we're gonna shift back. So it's not trail talks. This one's a book to action um, trail talk, I guess, if you wanna call it that. Um, and so this program uh, in particular is part of our 2020 book to action series. Uh, the programming, uh, a lot of the programming you've seen the last few months uh, has been in, inspired by uh, a book, uh, Island Visions. You might have seen it around as some of the themes that, you know, uh, programs that you that we've done in the last few months that are centered around a, a central theme. Um, so Island Visions is a book that was edited by Jacob Siegel and illustrated by Isaac Siegel Botner. Uh, which features essays, infographics, um, written by scientists, environmentalists, rangers, fishermen, and local outdoor enthusiasts, um, and explores what is special about our Channel, Channel Islands um, and why it's important to conserve uh, the environment and the cultural significance of them. Um, and this book is actually really cool. We have a lot of copies of them at the library. It's available for checkout. It's a big illustration, illustrative book. And it, lot, it had a lot of input from local community, um, like I said earlier, scientists and um, students, junior high students. I, they, they were really uh, fishermen. They connected with a lot of uh, people to put this just, in, just incredible, visually great um, resource. And um, we were able to, through this grant that we got uh, through the US Institute of Museum and Library Services, um, so shout out to them. Um, we we're able to get by, I want to say is almost 10 to 15 programs on the calendar that are centered, central themed around the Channel Islands. So um, this is one of them. So we appreciate that. Um, so we're going to shift gears here, get this thing rolling. Um, so we, I have the pleasure, we have the pleasure here at the library to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, and that is James Waptich. Uh, James is our library partner uh, for our typical the Trail Talk series, um, and we appreciate James so much for, for all the work that James does uh, to support the library, to help 
you know, put these trail talks together, uh, get us con in contact and connect with, with some of these speakers and, and authors and, and, and just, you know, we, we really do appreciate you, James, a lot for all your, all your hard work that you do for us here in, in our community. Um, James is an experienced backpacker, trail guide, and author of the Santa Barbara News Press hiking column, Trail Quest. Um, so once again, just a big thank you to you, James, uh, for helping coordinate these events. Um, also definitely want to shout out James's um, blog. So if you want to follow James's adventures, you can check out James's blog. And that's going to be at www.songsofthewilderness.com. Um, always got to plug the blog. You see it, uh, register for the newsletter. You get updates to, you know, things that James is working on, upcoming talks. Um, that's not not only like talks that we're doing here at the library with James, but just other announcements in, in, in that community. So it's a really great resource and a really great tool. And with that, James, I wanna, you know, switch gears here. Tonight's your talk, highlighting the hiking and backpacking opportunities and more uh, of our Channel Islands. So thank you for joining us, James. Thanks, Ahmad. Thanks for that great intro. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be part of the Book to Action series. There's a lot of great programming related to the Channel Islands. And it's just cool that the library uh, is availing itself of this great local resource, the, the Channel Islands. Um, my, my interest, um, well, my interest in the Channel Islands initially just came out of uh, a conversation I had with a friend at the farmer's market, uh, probably like 15 years ago. She had just said, oh, you know, I went for a hike out on Santa Cruz. And I was like, what, do you have your own boat or something? Um, cause I grew up here in Santa Barbara and the islands were like private property. Um, and that's when I learned that there was actually like a national park and that average people could go there. And so that year I went out and did some backpacking. And so that's kind of when I got hooked on the islands. Um, but about four years ago, I wrote a series of articles on the islands and I got really intrigued about the, the natural history. Um, I learned that two, 20,000 years ago when the sea level was about three to 400 feet lower, that the four islands off our coast were connected and formed one big island called Santa Rosé. And I got really intrigued about this idea of like this one big island off the coast. And as I kind of dug into it, I got really intrigued, like what did it look like? And could you make like a verse of it? And, you know, obviously you need a time machine to do that, but um, just the imagining that you could like walk this big long island got me really intrigued. Um, so when I did this series of articles, I kind of did it with the spirit of doing a traverse. And so I, did my best to traverse the four islands in a east to west direction. And uh, conveniently, the islands kind of broke up in an east to west direction. Uh, 20,000 years ago, it was one big island. And then about you know 10,000, about 11,000 to 10,300 years ago, Anacapa kind of popped off. And then 9,000 know, to 9,400 years ago, um, Santa Cruz separated from Santa Rosa. And then you know about 300 years later, Santa Rosa and San Miguel separated. Uh, so it was just kind of intriguing to realize that not only was taking that course, um, you know, kind of tracing the island, but also kind of followed it as it separated into smaller pieces. Um, and then I got particularly excited when I learned, I'm going to just hop back here, that um, the oldest human remains in North America were found on, on the Channel Islands on Santa Rosa in Arlington Canyon. Um, I put this back here just because it shows that it was just four to five miles to get out to the islands. Uh, from the mainland back then. And uh, I put this white dot on Santa Rosa. That's roughly where Arlington Canyon is. I don't know exactly where the remains were found, but it, it is on the existing island. And they date back 13,000 years. And uh, the islands didn't start separating until about 11,000 years ago. So that means someone actually was out on the islands uh, when it was one big island. So not only was that just a fantasy of mine, but someone actually lived that. So that became really compelling too, to think like, wow, someone actually got to be out on the island and probably not just someone, like a number of uh, Shumash people. This other dot here is uh, um, Mount Diablo. That's the highest point on Santa Cruz. And it was also the highest point on Santa Rosé. Um, so I just put that in a little bit of perspective that there would have been like a high ridge, if you will, or mountain ridge. Uh, that one could have followed or one might have followed the coastal plain if they were you know doing a traverse back in the day um, here's just another um reconstructed map kind of showing what some of the old waterways might have been you know that kind of just adds some flavor to what what this uh, big island might have looked like uh, put a little note here uh during the last glacial maximum you know about twenty thousand years ago the islands were covered with a lot of pines and conifers uh, but about 12,000 years ago, you know, 1100, 800 years, 11,800 years ago, uh, transitioned more into oaks and chaparral like we see now. Uh, 
but I did want to put in a picture of some of the, the trees that uh, would have been there because they're they're still growing in areas in Northern California. So they're the Gowan Cypress, uh, the Douglas fir, and then the Bishop Pine, which actually still is on the island. So these were like the three conifers you would have seen if you could have got out on the islands like 20,000 years ago, or, or even 13,000 years ago, you would have seen these different conifers uh, with a kind of a rich understory of some other plants before it transitioned into oak and chaparral. Uh, during the last ice age, California was just wetter and cooler. Um, there were redwoods down the coast all the way down to Los Angeles. They have found uh, remnants of redwoods in the La Brea tar pits and the Carpinteria tar pits. Um, the redwoods now have retreated, you know, further north past uh, Hearst Castle uh, as it's gotten warmer and drier. And there's a lot of other uh, plants that were down here further south as well. So how the Chumash would have gotten out to the islands 13,000 years ago is with uh, Thule boats. Um, if you're familiar with, with uh, the Chumash culture, they, they use Thule reeds to build their houses, uh, but they also use them to build these boats and they would just bundle them and then lash those bundles together to make a, a seaworthy vessel. And, um, you know, a boat this size could have like two to three people in it. So it wasn't like a big, you know, uh, transport vehicle, but uh, a journey could be made across the channel. And again, uh, 13,000 years ago, it was just four or five miles. And you would, of course, want to time that journey uh, to, you know, when the seas are calm, uh, just to give yourself the best advantage. And I imagine that the Shumesh went out there initially, you know, just for the fact that there were resources out there, you know, in sort of an untapped area with a, a lot of great coastal resources that one could access and in inland, you know, things to find that could be, you know, utilized and developed. Um, so how did the islands get here in the first place? This is actually an interesting piece of story. Uh, they were never connected to the mainland at any point. Uh, they are an extension of the Santa Monica Mountains. About 30 million years ago, there was a tectonic plate uh, the Fairlawn Plate was an oceanic plate, and it was diving under the North American Plate, and this did a lot of mountain building. But when that plate uh, played out, it brought in behind it the Pacific Plate. Uh, only instead of subducting, the Pacific Plate met it at an angle. Um, so the Pacific Plate is actually sliding north, uh, northwest against the North American Plate, and it's creating a transform fault, and that's the San Andreas Fault. And that sliding is what creates the earthquakes. But while it was doing that, it also picked up pieces of North America. Um, this is a little animation that Tanya Atwater made, kind of showing how the Pacific plate grabbed part of the North American plate. And in doing so, uh, a piece of that plate, a block of material, which is, became the transverse mountains, got rotated 90 degrees. So if you kind of look there in the middle, that little block called SB, uh, is our area, and that got rotated 90 degrees and arrived at the position you see sort of in this little drawing, or this, this graphic. And so that's how, that's how the um, islands got to be oriented the way they are, same with the San Inez Mountains and uh, the whole transverse range being an east-west range. <clears throat> Something that happened while, those, uh, while that land block was being dragged is it, it thinned the uh, ocean uh, uh, mantle and <clears throat> volcanic material actually seeped up uh, so a lot of these islands started out as volcanic, uh, and then there was sedimentary material deposited on it. And then surprisingly, they weren't actually uplifted until 5 million years ago. And how that happened is that in addition to the Pacific plate, you know, sliding against the North American plate, there's a point at which it kind of collides with the North American plate right here. It's what's called the Big Bend. I put a little red dot just to try to call it out because I don't have a, a pointer for these Zoom calls. But at the Big Bend, it's kind of running into the North American plate and sliding against it at the same time. Again, local geologist Tanya Outwater has a great term for that. She calls that transpression. And that's actually what lifted up the transverse mountains, lifted up the Senez Mountains, the Channel Islands, what makes Mount Pinos as, as tall as it does for our area. And the Senez Mountains are actually some of the fastest growing mountains in the world right now. They're still rising, same with the Channel Islands. Uh, so a little interesting tidbit about our islands. Um, so yeah, in this Imagine Journey, um, I mean, in a series of articles, the first place you're gonna go to is Anacapa. And so what I did with the series of articles is, is I kind of contrasted the natural history of the islands and the history, I mean, the history of the islands breaking up, plus just what you could go see as a hiker today and a camper, um, because that's the best way to experience the islands. And what I'm not gonna include in this talk is a lot of the history of the ranching era or who owned the islands or all of that, because that's like a whole separate talk. 
a um, little more interested in just sort of the natural history of the islands and again the hiking backpacking and camping opportunities so that's going to focus on so this is the very eastern end of Anacapa and it probably would have been a dozen miles further east uh you know during the last ice age but um it's still kind of a cool site to come up on the island and uh, the easiest way to get there now is uh, with island packers they have regular boat trips out to the islands um it's almost like a bus you just like you know go go get your ticket and go down to the harbor and uh, the harbor in ventura and then ride out uh, anacap is about a 40 minute boat 45 minute boat ride and on the boat ride you're almost invariably accompanied by the dolphins who like to come and ride the wake so you're already getting uh, exposure to uh what the what the channel has to offer uh, so this is coming into anacapa uh, so eastern anacapa and middle anacapa are pretty low profile and then uh, western anacapa does have a little more topography only eastern anacapa is open to visitors uh, this is arch rock kind of a, an iconic uh, image of of the island this is the old uh, landing dock uh, it's temporarily closed because they're replacing it with a, a newer one and um, it probably anacapa is probably not going to be open until like the end of summer uh, but there are when it's open there are generally year-round trips out to anacapa so it's one of the islands you can visit year-round so uh, this information is still going to be relevant when you um, get a chance to go there it's a little map of uh, Anacapa Island. Um, there's a, a little figure eight loop network of the trails on Eastern Anacapa Island. And uh, that entire loop is, is just two miles. And then the little side trail out to the lighthouse is less than a half mile. So even during a, a boat ride out there for just a day hike, you could actually do that loop like twice. Um, and so there's plenty of time on a day trip just to hike the whole island and really see anything and see everything at a very leisurely pace. Uh, there's also camping on the island. There's uh, seven campsites that are available. So if you did want to spend the night or a couple nights, um, there's no beach access. But if you had scuba gear or wanted to snorkel, you could go down to the landing cove and uh, tool around there. Uh, but really what, what there is to do on the island is, is wander around and check it out. Uh, there is no water on the island. So if you're camping or even if you're day hiking, you need to bring all the water you need. Um, this is just a view of the island. Uh, kind of giving you a feel for it. There are no trees on Anacapa. Uh, it was kind of grazed down by the, the sheep grazing for 50 years. Uh, so it's mostly just low chaparral plants and some non-natives mixed in. Um, one of the highlights that you would see there is uh, giant Coryopsis. And then also seagulls. Uh, so the giant Coryopsis, they're in bloom from March through April. And then the seagulls are busy raising families April through June. So if there was a magic time to go, I'd probably say April because you might catch both of them. Uh, the seagulls uh, have their open nests out there on the island and they're very protective. So there's certain times of that uh, breeding season where they'll actually chase you away from their nest. Uh, other times it's just you get to kind of see it happening and it's kind of cute to see the chicks. Uh, I remember one of the docents saying, uh, if you see a seagull in Santa Barbara or Ventura, it was likely born on Anacapa or Santa Barbara Islands because these are the two big uh, breeding grounds for seagulls. Uh, so it's kind of cool to think that they probably all came from either Anacapa or Santa Barbara Island. This is a view out Cathedral Cove. Um, all, all the great views from Anacapa on the hike are out, you know, out across the, uh, so that, it, you know, across the ocean from you know, kind of looking down into the, the shoreline. Uh, you'll also get to see sea lions in some of these little pockety coves. And then of course, the epic view on Anacapa is from Inspiration Point, looking west out towards the rest of um, rest of the Anacapa Islands out towards Santa Cruz. Uh, the Chumash name for the island is, is Anya Park, and that's where uh, Anacapa came from. And one interpretation of that word is mirage, but I think a more interesting interpretation is ever-changing. Uh, because between Eastern Anacapa and Middle Anacapa, there's, you can actually see a sandbar there during low tide and same with the other island. So it is kind of ever changing in a way that sometimes it can almost look like one big island and other times it can look like several different islands. And then, you know, in the fog, it can even have a different characteristic. So it really does have a more dynamic nature uh, versus like being a mirage. Um, the lighthouse, that's a feature to visit. The original um, lighthouse out there was an acetylene beacon. And then that got replaced, you know, with the current lighthouse. And then that was automated uh, in 1966. So it's kind of just been 
um, just an automated thing. There's no one, there's no one stationed there anymore. There are rangers stationed on the island, so there is personnel out there, but the lighthouse is sort of fully automated. There are some cool birds out there. I was surprised to see hummingbirds and uh, red-tailed hawk. Uh, this is a view looking towards uh, Western Anacapa from Santa Cruz Island. And I put this in here primarily just to talk about um, on Western Anacapa, there are two canyons that do have chaparral and oak woodland in them, you know, little pockets of that. So they are like remnants of a time when it was a little more covered uh, even if it was just oak and chaparral. Uh, and then that, that's the highest point on Anac um, Western Anac Kappa that you can see there. So it kind of gives you a sense that, you know, maybe you might've traced, the, if you're, you know, doing a traverse of Santa Rosé, you might've traced this ridge line on your way out to uh, Santa Cruz. I did find this one map that showed it, what it looked like when Anac Kappa kind of bubbled off from uh, the rest of uh, Santa Rosé. Uh, so you can kind of get a feel like, oh, I see it's sort of down nearby um, San Pedro Point where you might've made landfall and then continued if you're doing a traverse. And then this is still even cool. This is like, you know, 11,000 years ago, there was still like a big island with this other little island that, you know, was a giant Anacapa version. So the next island we're visiting is, is Santa Cruz. And uh, this is approaching it on Island Packers. The boat ride from Island Packers is about an hour. Um, and this ridge you're seeing in the distance is the Montagnon Ridge. And that kind of defines uh, a significant portion of Eastern Santa Cruz Island. It kind of divides it from the isthmus that then you know, connects to the rest of the island. Uh, so how the Shumash uh, likely came into this area or, or their ancestors is during the same last ice age, about 20,000 years ago, the sea level was lower, but this is also true up there between Asia and North America where the Bering Land Bridge was, that the sea level was low enough that the Asia and North America were connected. And so there, there are two theories about how the peoples of Asia came into North America. One is what's called the ice-free corridor, is that, you know, although it was glaciated, that there was this path that could be followed, you know, over the, uh, over the land, and that Native people were following, you know, big game animals, you know, like the mammoths and, and other large um, grazing uh, animals that they were hunting, and that they just followed them into North America. And another more recent theory that's that's equally compelling um, is the coastal migration theory, or what's called the kelp highway, is that along the coast from Japan all the way down to Baja and even down into South America, that there are often kelp forests off kelp forests off the coast, and that there would be a lot of great resources right along the shoreline and offshore that uh, people could follow uh, as as they spread out and you know look for new resources. And the reality is that either one of these could be true. I mean, I mean, both of them could be true, but these are just different pathways that, that people came over to land bridge into North America. Uh, this is a map showing the area that the Shumash uh, occupied uh, during the, the height of their culture. They uh, followed, uh, extended from Morro Bay down to Malibu, out to the Channel Islands and into the Carrizo Plain. Uh, in some ways, it's basically like the Tri-County area. So all of this is, is Shumash area that, that we're all now living on. And uh, a significant development in Shumash culture about 1500 years ago was the development of the Tomal. And this was a, definitely a, a game changer in the sense that um, this was made out of a, a redwood that was drifted down the coast, uh, either landing on the Channel Islands out on Santa Rosa or you know, on the coast near Carpinteria. And the redwood could be split into these planks that could be shaped. And then, you know, using just um, stones and shells, you know, scraped and um, smooth. And then they would actually steam the boards to give them some curvature. And then they would drill holes in the boards and lash them together. And then use uh, tule and some asphaltum and pine tar to kind of seal or caulk between the boards and also to seal the holes where they would like um, lash the, the boards together. And they can make these, uh, these basically canoes, these wooden plank canoes. And they could range from 80 to 30 feet in length, just kind of depending on uh, the material. And um, I might say the, the mood of the person, you know, the, the people making it like, hey, we need one this size, or we need one that size, or hey, the wood we have lets us make one this size. And um, where, whereas the Thule rafts could maybe take two or three people, um, a good sized tamal could have 20 people in it or it could carry up to 4,000 pounds. Uh, so it really helped uh, people travel up and down the coast or go out to the islands. And it really helped trade because you could you know, actually carry cargo more easily 
And this really helped enrich the Shumash culture uh, to a level that was kind of unique in, in California because of the extensive trade networks that they had and the resources that they were able to move around and, and utilize. Um, so the, the brother of the Tomal, Oh, shoot, a little typo there. The Brotherhood of the Tamal uh, lasted until 1834. The, the mission system, which I'll talk about a little bit later, you know, kind of decimated Chumash culture. Uh, but the, the Brother Tamal was, you know, sort of like a, um, a guild, like, like a, a guild or a clan that, that built Tamals. And it might take like six months to make a, a good sized Tamal. And so they had the knowledge and the skills, and, and that was their, their focus is to make those. And the, the last tamal was probably made, you know, in, in around 1834. And um, that knowledge was largely lost. Um, John P. Harrington in the early 1900s interviewed uh, Chumash descendants, or actually, I'm sorry, sorry surviving Chumash um, people and, and gathered information about their culture. And one of the people that he interviewed was Fernando Librado, who actually did witness uh, tamals being built. and uh, Harrington asked him at one point if he would be able to make one, and Fernando, you know, guided a group of people to build one based on the knowledge that he had, and that's in the upper corner of the picture, the color photo, and that's actually at the Museum of Natural History now in, in one of the halls, and he built that. And then in 1976, Peter Howarth and Travis Hudson, they, they built one using the same information that Harrington had gathered, and they called it the Hayek, which is a uh, humash for a peregrine falcon. And that was transported up to the island, and then they they um, paddled it inner island uh, between San Miguel, Santa Rosa, and Santa Cruz. Uh, but it wasn't until 1996 the Shumash Maritime Association, which is you know uh, the the descendants of the Shumash, uh, built built their own tamal, and it was called the um, Eluan of Sixtun, which is swordfish. Sixtun is the village of Santa Barbara. Uh, so it just means a swordfish of Santa Barbara. And in 2001 was the first Shumash uh, Tomal crossing uh, in like, like 150 years. Uh, so it was a very significant historical event uh, in our area. And then in, in 2009, a second one was built, uh, moved to Maya of Kalawashak, which means deep memories of Kalawashak. Kalawashak is a, a village in, uh, along the San Inez River in the San Inez Valley. Uh, at the time of the Spanish arrival, it was actually the largest Shumash village on, in the valley. And in 2011, both of those tamals went out to the islands. Uh, so it was the first joint crossing with two tamals. And at different times, they've landed either at Prisoner's Harbor or Smuggler's Cove on Santa Cruz. And there's probably been close to two dozen crossings now. So it's, uh, it's really cool to see this revival. Uh, it, you know, obviously, there's uh, a great benefit to the Shumash. But there's also just a great benefit for us to know that people used to do this and still can and are doing that. Uh, one of the inspiring things about Shumash culture to me is that all the resources that went into making, whether it's a tamal or a basket or the food resources, are still all out on the land right now, right? They're, they're not importing stuff from some faraway place like we are. Uh, they're utilizing resources that grow right here or can be found right here um, and that are still right here. You know, something about that just is uh, compelling and grounding. And it really just says that, you know, hey, we actually don't need to like bring so many resources into our area all the time to, to get things done. Um, so I don't know, it's inspiring. Uh, so this is the, the crew out here on uh, Santa Cruz. And then this is a uh, Scorpion Anchorage. So uh, for us just heading out with Island Packers, this is the, the, main, the main port on Santa Cruz Island, uh, the landing pier. And then um, you, from the landing pier, you head up Scorpion Canyon to uh, the campground. I put this particular shot in just because this, this rise kind of like uh, at the back of the photo, uh, there's a trail that starts right by, I guess it's by that white building that's the Cavern um, Point Loop Trail. So even from like the harbor, you can make a trail, you can take a hike that traces the north coast of the island and then drops you back down into the campground, you know, instead of just going up the main road to the campground, taking a little more scenery. Uh, if you want to see Channel Island foxes, Santa Cruz Scorpion Campground is your best bet because they're just all over that place. Um, 
remember on one of my uh, first trips out there, I, I kind of held back at the, the pier because I wanted to do the Cavern Point Loop and I kind of let the crowds rush up, you know, the road to go to the campground. And then as I was sitting there eating my lunch, I, I watched this fox visit every single picnic table in a little circuit after everyone had left. And it just knew the timing so well that it was like, oh, now here's the chance to go visit all these picnic tables and look for scraps. And um, and then I watched it investigate some gear that someone had left. And it was like, wow, these guys really have a, a system. And then the last time, the time I was out there just a couple of years ago, um, this one guy came up, could be a gal, this one fox came up and uh, looked like it was gonna drag my pack away. And uh, I kind of watched it because I was impressed that it was uh, it was that ambitious to take this pack. And I was trying to picture that it was going to take it to some little fox den that it had, but um, it was a little too heavy for the fox. You know, it was probably like 40, 50 pounds of all the stuff I'd brought out for the islands. Um, and I had to shoot off because it was tearing up my pack a little bit, but it was cute to see it really think that it was just going to walk away with this thing. Um, and then, of course, you know, the cuteness of the fox is, is, is really the best way to remember them. And the way that we can support the cuteness of the foxes is by not feeding them um, because they are wild animals and they don't really benefit from, from our food. Uh, so when I came out to Santa Cruz, the, the time that I was writing a series of articles, uh, I was ostensibly going to do a traverse. So you know, went to Scorpion Campground and then I was going to follow um, the hike up over Montagnon Ridge and then head out uh, towards Del Norte Camp and end at Prisoner's Harbor. Uh, this is a great backpacking trip you can do on Santa Cruz. I think it's better to do it the other way, uh, but because I was doing my east-west reverse, this is how I did it. But that really the better way to do it is go to Prisoner's Harbor and then hike to Del Norte Camp, which is just four miles. Uh, and then on your second day, go from Del Norte to Scorpion, which is 11 miles. There is no water at uh, Prisoner's Harbor or Del Norte, so you have to carry your water for the first day and your second day. Uh, going this way. But the good news is you can run out of water when you get to Scorpion because there is water at Scorpion Campground. So when you're camping at Scorpion, you don't need to bring water because there's water there that's available. Uh, it's tank water with a little bit of a chlorine flavor. So I, I still bring my own water uh, if I'm just carrying it because better tasting water. Uh, but going the other way, I had to come up with a different strategy. You know, I had to load up on water at Scorpion and know that I was probably going to run out of prisoners. So I actually had uh, a friend meet me out at Prisoners Harbor and you know, bring some extra water because uh, I also want to do the hike out to Pelican Bay, which I'll tell you about. Um, what I'm not going to mention is the hike out to, score, uh, to smugglers, not because there's anything wrong with it. It's actually a great hike, but just in the interest of time. Uh, but I put in a mileage here because it's like about seven miles round trip out to Smugglers Cove, which is a great hike. And then uh, I put in how far it is to Montagnon Peak, which is about eight miles round trip, uh, just because I'm going to mention it. So if you just want to do this today hike, you could also do that. Uh, this is the Cavern Point Loop Trail coming up from uh, Scorpion. Just some great views back towards Anacapa. Threw in some pictures of the different birds you might see. And then here's a view looking along the North Shore as you continue along the Cavern Point Loop. And then one of the highlights of the trail is um, getting to see Potato Harbor, so just a very scenic harbor. And then you can drop back down into uh, Scorpion Camp. Uh, there's a lower and upper, but it's got 25 total campsites and six group campsites. And of course, plenty of foxes. I put this photo in here just to see how, what the size of these foxes are. They're basically like about the size of a house cat. Um, I went online um, to recreation.gov just to see you know, what the availability is. Uh, the islands have gotten a lot more popular. So the likelihood of being able to go to the islands like next week or next month uh, on a whim is is pretty remote. You have to kind of plan ahead. Like you should be thinking six months ahead if you want to go to the islands, um, just to try to make sure you got uh, a place to stay. Uh, day trips, a little more flexibility, but uh, I was on the Island Packers website and same thing, people have been planning ahead. So they're going to want to do that too. Uh, so from the upper end of uh, Scorpion Campground is when you pick up the, the trail that goes up into Scorpion Canyon and this is how you get up to the Montagnon Ridge. Uh, one of the times I was out there, I got to see some foxes. Um, I knew that foxes could climb trees, uh, but I never actually seen it. So that was kind of cool to get a picture of a fox uh, nibbling on some toyon berries. And uh, I want to take just a little bit to talk about the foxes. Um, the record shows that the, not the record, but um, our archaeological, archaeological evidence suggests that the foxes have been on the islands about six or 10,000 years ago. Um, you know, there's two theories. One is that the foxes rafted out there on some driftwood or something. Uh, another seemingly more likely theory is that the shoe mesh brought them out there. Um, 
but they lived on the islands and uh, they're a little bit smaller than the mainland, uh, the mainland gray fox that they descended from. And uh, on the islands, they don't have any predators because uh, they're like kind of the top dog, no pun intended, but you know, they're, they're the, like the top of the food chain. Um, and they kind of got used to that. And so the foxes actually were you know, listed as an endangered animal for a while. And it was sort of an unfortunate, perfect storm of circumstances. Uh, during the ranching era, there were a lot of uh, pigs that were raised on the island that went feral. So there were feral pigs. Uh, pigs grow like good sized broods and, and breed frequently. Uh, so there were just a lot of piglets on the islands. Um, back in the 60s, um, DDT was uh, dumped in the ocean. And this got into the food chain affecting bald eagles and, and the brown pelicans. And the impact it had on both those birds is it thinned the eggshells when they laid eggs. And so uh, their numbers just dramatically declined. Um, with fewer bald eagles, the golden eagles on the mainland started like, you know, drifting out to the islands and checking it out. And what the golden eagles found on the islands was all these piglets, which are just like, you know, really tasty morsels because um, they could just grab them and eat them. And then what they also noticed these golden eagles is that the gray fox, I mean, the island fox is basically the same size as a piglet and just as tasty uh, to a golden eagle. And because the foxes you know, aren't really used to predators, they didn't really you know, know how to respond to the golden eagles. And with all the grazing, there was less cover. And so the, the, gray fo the island fox has started dramatically declining. In 1999, there were only 5% of the original amount of uh, island foxes on the Northern Islands. And then on Catalina, there was a different issue that happened, um, whereas only 10% were left. And what happened on Catalina is because there's a, a, a what do I want to say, a human population on the island, like people actually live out on Catalina, there's houses and whatnot, is that a raccoon was a stowaway on a boat out there and brought canine distemper and, you know, uh, killed about 90% of the, um, the foxes. Uh, so a captive breeding, captive breeding program was put into place, <clears throat> but in addition to that, uh, two other measures were taken. The, the pigs were eradicated on Santa Rosa to remove the food source uh, for the golden eagles, and the bald eagle uh, population, you know, also through some breeding programs and repopulation, was brought back uh, because the bald eagles are pretty territorial, and they only eat, you know, stuff from the ocean typically, so they're not, they don't look at the foxes as a food source. Uh, but them being established on the island would keep the golden eagles off. So they kind of, you know, did a three-prong attack to counter the decline of the, the island foxes, you know, captive breeding, uh, eliminating the pigs, and then bringing, about the, bringing back the bald eagles. Uh, in 2016, um, the foxes on the Northern Islands were delisted from endangered. Um, and then they were still listed as threatened on Santa Catalina just because um, even though their numbers have come back, they face a different set of threats, right? Um, foxes on Catalina can get run over, they can drown in people's pools, they can eat rat poison. You know, there's just a lot more hazards that they face there. There were also um, island foxes on San Miguel and San Clemente, but they were not, um, I'm sorry, San Nicolas and San Clemente, but they weren't impacted because they, they weren't in the area that the golden eagles were visiting. Uh, so it is one of the success stories that the foxes have come back. Anyway, so climbing up out of Scorpion uh, Canyon, you eventually uh, start making your way toward the Mountain Ridge. Um, old oil derricks, someone thought they were going to find oil on the island. Uh, what they found was water. Um, this is a view looking towards the Mountain Ridge. Uh, there is actually some area here that does have some ironwood and it is a little bit forested um, with some chaparral. About 80, 90% of Eastern Santa Cruz is, is grassland um, from just years of grazing. Uh, but there are forested areas and as the grazing has ended, you know, now for like 25, 40 years, uh, more of the forest is coming back. Did see some, uh, some of the island jay uh, in this area. Uh, I was surprised to see it this far east, uh, but it's, I guess it's, I mean, it's, it's the area that would cover, but the first few years that I went there, I only saw it over by Pelican Bay. And then I think I saw a burrowing owl, burrowing owl. Uh, so eventually you make up to the, um, the Mount Tignon Ridge and there's a way to hike out towards Mount Tignon Peak. And you might see some mounds of stones. And what these are 
is remnants from when the Chumash had uh, spirit pools out on uh, the Mountainion Ridge. And uh, they've also had them on other places out on the island. And I've seen some places on the mainland where they have them. Then the purpose of these were to have a place to, uh, in my, uh, let's say my opinion, to focus, you know, prayers, um, to make offerings, uh, particularly in coming into the solstice to call in uh, a good year. And it's interesting that that's, that's something that, uh, that's a personal practice I have. And it's just something in this area that I think is interesting as a, a cultural tradition is to call in a good year because rain plays a very pivotal part. Um, there's, there's actually a Schumann story about the significance of that that uh, I think is interesting because of how much we as modern people still like track how much rain. Is it an El Nino or a La Nina year? Um, in, in the Shumash cosmology, there, there are three worlds. There's this middle world that, that we all live on right now. And then there's an upper world where, you know, the, the, the spirits live. And then a, a lower world where, you know, the, the darker, more dangerous energies, energies live. Um, in the middle world, before, the, before death came to the middle world, the, the animals could speak and um, the animals uh, were immortal. And then when death came, some of the animals moved up to the upper world uh, with, you know, the, what you might call the, the, the gods. And in, in the upper world, uh, there was this game that was played every day. And this is similar to a game that the, the Shumash played at one time, which was called Peon. And how that was played is you'd have a, a black stick and a white stick or a black bone and a white bone. And there'd be two teams and one player would you know, mix up which was in which hand and then put it behind his back. And then the other team would guess. And if they guessed correctly, they'd get a, a counting stick. And then typically it'd be whoever won all the counting sticks. You might have like a dozen or 20 counting sticks and you just play back and forth, um, you know, kind of like war until someone had all of the counting sticks. And what they did in the, the upper world is that they would, there was two teams. There was the sun and great eagle on one team. And then the other team was sky coyote and the morning star. And they would play this game each night. And then the moon, who was a referee, would keep a tally. And then at the end of the year, a count was made about you know, who won the most games. And if uh, Sky Coyote won, uh, I mean, if Sky Coyote's team won, there would be good rain. Uh, there'd be you know, bountiful harvest. There'd be you know, game out there because um, there'd be good water. And water was really a game changer. And if the sun and Great Eagle won, there would be drought. And the sun would collect its debt, you know, through through the the death and hardship that would occur. Uh, and again, I think it's interesting because we we look to what the rain is going to be for more or less the same reason. Like, are we going to have a hard year because it's a drought or a lack of water, or are we going to have like an easier year because there's lots of good rain? So from Mount Run Ridge, you can you get some good views out across Anacapa and out towards the mainland. You can also see down towards Smugglers. That's the olive grove down by Smugglers. There is a way to make a loop following the ridges down to smugglers and, and kind of go that way. The Chumash name for Santa Cruz is, is Limu, which just means in the sea. Um, looking west from the Montagnon Ridge, you can see out towards uh, Red Mountain and uh, Mount Diablo. And the trail continues down the backside of the Montagnon Ridge, moves across the island. Uh, the next big intersection is the turn off down to Chinese Harbor. Uh, to run down to Chinese Harbor and back is about three and a half miles. Uh, I've done this a couple of times. Just for some reason, I find it a compelling destination. A lot of elevation gain and loss. So uh, it's a little bit of a workout, but it drops down to the, the little harbor down there. I mean, the little cove down there. And it's pretty scenic. Uh, past that turnoff, you get to the next turnoff, which is towards uh, Del Norte Camp. And Del Norte Camp has four sites. Uh, there is, uh, it's called Backcountry Camping. And you just go to recreation.gov also, you don't select which site, but there's only four available, right? So if four people have selected uh, backcountry camping, then that's it for the, the options at that place. Uh, there, again, there's no water at Del Norte Camp, so you do have to bring all your own resources. Um, the last time I was there, the Island Jays were, were visiting me in this place as well. Um, the Island Jay is descended from the, the Scrub Jay on the mainland, uh, but they're a third larger. And they're only found on Santa Cruz Island now. So they're their own endemic species. <coughs> and uh, they are considered one of the, the rarest birds in the world. During the last ice age, you know, they did cover more of the island. They have found um, 
uh, archaeological evidence of the Island J on Santa Rosa and San Miguel uh, with you know them apparently like dying out around maybe eight or 10,000 years ago. And likely what happened is that when the islands separated that uh, those islands just became less wooded and drier. And so there wasn't enough habitat for the, the J to, to survive there. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna put it out there. Hopefully Santa Rosa will become more forested at some point and maybe some people will say, hey, let's put some Jays out there and see how they do. Um, Cause that might be a cool thing. Uh, so from Del Norte camp, you make your way down to Prisoner's Harbor. Uh, it's called Prisoner's Harbor because in 1830, uh, someone dropped 30 prisoners out there thinking that that was a good idea. Um, they were quickly rounded up again. But the idea of making the island into some, some kind of penal colony was floated a couple times over the years. I'm glad that that never happened. Um, there is talk of putting in a new camp. Um, so I found this photo kind of showing where it is, pretty close to the pier. Uh, in the general plan, something that I heard a, a number of years ago talking to someone connected to the National Park was that another place where they were thinking of putting a camp as well was over at Smugglers, which would be actually pretty cool in, in my mind because you could hike to Del Norte and then hike over to Smugglers and then hike over to Scorpion. Uh, but what would you what you would need is a water source over at Scorpion at, at Smugglers. Uh, this is just another shot of uh, Eastern Santa Cruz. So um, a, a great day hike you can do, a great day trip is you can take the boat with the Islands Packers and go straight to Prisoner's Harbor. Um, actually, they probably stop at Scorpion and go over to Prisoner's Harbor. But you can do a day hike out onto um, to Pelican Bay. And uh, you can sort of see in this map that the, the eastern quarter of uh, Santa Cruz is part of Channel, Channel Islands National Park and the western three quarters is controlled by the Nature Conservancy. And so the Pelican Bay um, hike is on the Nature Conservancy land, but they, they do allow people to go there, provided they're accompanying with a, a docent from Island Packers. So there is a way to go see this part of the island. <coughs> Excuse me. Recovering from a cold. So the trail from um, prisoners, you know, pulls away from the the harbor and gets up on the on the bluffs above the coast. And um, because grazing ended earlier on the Nature Conservancy part of the land, there's actually more forest coming back, and it's also a more forested part of the island today. Um, so it, it's a really scenic hike. Like if you were just going to do one hike, this might be the one to do. Um, at a point, it kind of rounds a corner and gets into like a, a good stand of ironwood, which is kind of cool. Uh, ironwood used to be up along, up and down the coast in California and inland to Nevada until about six million years ago. It was like a pretty prevalent plant. And um, they think that one of the things that happened is about seven to four million years ago, the California coast, I mean, the California current changed, uh, became a lot stronger. And what that did is it made drier summers here. Um, that was one of the impacts. And this ironwood really didn't, that didn't work for it. You know, there are a lot of plants that um, need, need a, a cooler, wetter summer. So now ironwood can only be found on the north facing slopes of Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, Catalina, and San Clemente. And um, <clears throat> you can actually find it on the mainland in a couple of places where people have planted it. And uh, I do want to give a little plug here for the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, because you can see ironwood there and you can see like just about you can see most of the plants that are on the islands at the Botanic Garden because they have a, an island section. And that is just a great resource to the community because you can go check out some of these plants before you go and when you come back. And it's just a way to kind of get a, a good visual reference and a good sense of them, um, you know, uh, while you're out there and while you're back at home. So it just makes it a little more um, convenient to not, to, to not be to not have to go to the islands just to see the plants, right? You can also see them in the Botanic Garden. Uh, also Bishop Pine, uh, you'll see out there. Um, and then these are some other plants that, you know, um, <coughs> uh, Manzanita and Lemonade Berry. These are both plants that you can find on the mainland. It is likely that some of the plants on the islands were brought out by the Shumash uh, because both Manzanita and Lemonade Berry do have some some food um, uses, and particularly the oaks, 
uh, seems like they would have brought out there as well. Um, there probably would have also been oaks out there uh, on their own anyways, but it seems like they would have brought them out as well. This is heading orchards for Pelican Bay. Um, just before Pelican Bay, there's a little side cove that they'll take you down into, which is Tinker's Cove. And this is where uh, a black and white silent movie in 1924 was made called Peter Pan. And so it was called Tinker's Cove, you know, in, uh, is a nickname for the, from that movie. And then this is Pelican's Cove. This is as far uh, west as you can get on um, Nature Conservancy land uh, without being part of some special program. So just the average person like you or me can do this. Uh, so I made that sort of the end of my traverse from Santa, Santa Cruz. Uh, this is from a boat ride, but this is sort of in about that same area where I did get to see a bald eagle from, from the boat. So we're going to move over to Santa Rosa. So those two separated about 9,700 to 9,400 years, uh, 1,000 years ago. Uh, so going into Santa Rosa, those trees that you can see there on that hillside, those are the Torrey Pines. So I'm going to get to those. Um, but that's kind of another unique uh, endemic plant on the islands. Santa Rosa is the second biggest island of the, the four islands. Uh, Santa Cruz is actually the biggest island. It's 96 square miles. Santa Rosa is the second biggest. It's 83 square miles. But all 83 of those square miles are within Channel Islands National Park. So in a way, Santa Rosa is the biggest island you can explore. Like you can tromp around the most and cover the most area. Um, you can also do what's called backcountry beach camping on Santa Rosa. And so that's what I'm going to emphasize on, on this particular discussion because it's, it's one of the unique things you can do uh, with Santa Rosa. Um, I wish I had a little pointer, but uh, if you can kind of see where it says uh, Becker's Bay, you know, there's a little campground symbol. So that's Water Canyon. That's about a mile and a half in from the pier. That's where you would just do your regular camping. But you can also do some backcountry beach camping on the North Shore. Uh, the closest place is about five miles into Cow Canyon. And you can also do backcountry beach camping on the South Shore. And there's different camps in, not camps, places where you can camp that are roughly eight, nine, 11 miles in. And then what I did for my traverse, if you will, um, I'd really wanted to try to do like a circuit, uh, but I just didn't have enough days in, in my schedule or life to do that. So what I did is I went to Cow Canyon on the first day and then crossed the island uh, north, south, going over Black Mountain and Soledad Peak and coming out uh, close to Ford Point and then camping at Water Canyon the last day, I mean the fourth day, uh, the third day, wow. This cold's kind of catching up with me. <clears throat> the scale of this map is really great. Um, in this slide, it's not so helpful, but uh, you can find us on the Channel Islands website and it actually has a lot of great detail. Like this map wasn't there like four years ago, but I definitely recommend this map uh, because it, it shows like, actually shows all of the trails that I'm aware of out there. Whereas the National Geographic map, which is a good resource that you can carry, doesn't show like all the trails. And what this map also has, if you could zoom in on it, it, uh, it actually shows the places that they call, you know, common beach camping locations, which is kind of helpful to get a feel for where people have been beach camping, um, just because it takes some of the guesswork out of it. Um, a, a note of caution about backcountry beach camping, this is not something that, well, first of all, I want to say it's backpacking. The only way you can get to these places is by backpacking. And this is not something for the casual hiker. You really do need to be an experienced backpacker because they're just challenges that you're going to find out there um, that you just have to deal with. And so if this is like your first backpacking trip, you're better off being on Santa Cruz and doing, you know, the one from Prisoners to Del Norte over to um, Scorpion. Uh, so you do need to be a little more experienced. Uh, you do need to read all the rules and regulations before you go so that there's no misunderstanding. Um, Santa Rosa, like all the other Channel Islands, there are no open fires. You have to use a cook stove. Um, you have to pack out everything. Um, you definitely want to check in with the ranger before you start your hike. You can even try to get one on the phone before you go because knowing current conditions is really valuable. Um, I did backcountry beach camping in 2013 and then came back five years later and some of the water conditions were different and some of the trail conditions were different. I was actually surprised uh, to see that, that subtle difference or in some cases, significant difference. Um, <clears throat> Now we're kind of running late on time, but I'm just going to 
kind of continue along and hope you guys can hang in there because there's a, a lot of good, uh, useful information. So backcountry beach camping on the island is only available starting in August uh, to the end of the year. And from August 15th to December 15th, it's only on the South shore uh, between South Point and East Point. So I put those two little arrows to kind of show the area. And really the places we're talking about that you would typically go is San Augustine, Ford, and Hoya, Vis Hoya Vieja Canyon are the, like the three outlets where you'd be looking to do uh, the beach camping. And then in September, it opens up for the, the rest of the island, quote unquote, you know, the rest of the island. But effectively what the, Uh, effectively, what that really means is from Cow Canyon West, you know, wrapping all the way around to East Point, with the exception of the Sandy Point closure, which is closed year round. Um, th those are basically the areas that you'd be looking to camp. And where you're allowed to camp is above the high tide line. Uh, so what you need is, you know, beaches that are wide enough to have a high tide line with still area above it that you could you could camp in. And then your second factor is water. You know, you're going to want to carry water but you're also gonna to have to look for water on the island. Um, there are nine canyons on the island that have intermittent water uh, year round. And I listed them down here. Uh, water Canyon is where Water Canyon Camp is. There's already water tanks there, so that's not really helpful. Old, old ranch house, I mean, it is helpful, but it's better water just in the tanks. Um, <clears throat> old ranch house uh, canyon, I've never actually seen water in there. Uh, on the South Shore, San Augustine, Rec, and La Jolla Vieja Canyon uh, all have some water in it, but um, the times I've been there, I have found water in there. Um, and then on the North Shore, Arlington, Soledad, Cow, and Lobo Canyon all have water in it. Um, if you could zoom in on this map more when you get it from the website, you can kind of see where these canyons are located. And that's going to determine a little bit what kind of trip you could even create. Um, there's also great water at Clap Spring. That's at... Um, blue dot that I put there on the map. Uh, that's actually the best tasting water on the island. Uh, you definitely want to filter it, just like all the water on the island you want to filter. What I've noticed of the water in the in the creeks is that it's it's a little bit, um, it's got a lot of tan and a lot of minerals, got some rich flavor. Um, you're not going to get your water like close to where you're camping, meaning because you're going to camp close to the, you know, the, the mouth of the, the creek. You're going to want to go inland a little bit like potentially a quarter mile to find a place where it's it's flowing a little bit better and maybe a deep enough pool you can gather it. And the last time I was there, it, it had rained the day before. So that really helped uh, improve the flow and the flavor. But uh, when I ran out of the water that I brought from the mainland, uh, I definitely noticed like, wow, I kind of missed that water. Um, so uh, know that it's a little bit adverse. And yeah, so you want to check in with the ranger before you go on current conditions. And you're also going to check in with them or her the minute you arrive on the island, they're going to want to talk to you and go over the regulations. And they're going to want to know who's out there and, and what your capability is. So again, it's not for the casual backpacker, but if you're an experienced backpacker, it, it's also a really rewarding experience. So from the landing pier, you'd, you'd go through the old ranch buildings, uh, take Smith Highway up towards Carrington and Lobo Point. Uh, there's some views looking back towards um, the South Shore not the South Shore, but towards Water Canyon and where the Torrey Pines are. Um, a side trip can be made out to Carrington Point. It's about, um, it's about three miles round trip, but it will burn up some time. Um, somewhere out here towards Carrington Point is where they found the, uh, a really intact uh, skeleton of a pygmy mammoth. It's like you know 90% or 95% whole. It was a really great discovery. Um, Roughly two million years ago, the the Colombian mammoths, uh, you know, were pretty prevalent uh, throughout um, parts of North America, and during the last ice age, the the mammoths did go out there to the islands. They swam out there. Uh, they they could swim like thirty miles easily. And as you remember from that original chart, it was only like four or five miles to swim out to the islands. <clears throat> and what would have drawn the mammoths out there is uh, was the smell of vegetation and the, the ability to, you know, have uh, new foraging areas. And uh, I put this little note to remind myself that they found remains of the pygmy mammoths on uh, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, uh, San Miguel, as well as on Catalina and San Nicolas. Uh, so they did swim out to, um, they did swim out to the, the Southern Islands as well. Uh, when they swam out to the Channel, the Northern Channel Islands, it was one big island at the time. 
And it is possible that they, they think now also that, you know, um, there wasn't just, you know, one ice age. There was a series of times where the sea level rose and broke the islands into different parts and different times where the sea level dropped and there was one big island, you know, that happened multiple times. And so it is likely that the mammoths actually went out there several times and then, you know, perished out there over time because of dwindling resources. This is uh, from the Museum of Natural History, just kind of showing the size difference as the pygmy mammoth um, shrank on the island. <clears throat> and, you know, how it shrank over time was that uh, to make, to be able to survive with the limited resources, you know, the, the mammoth just became smaller. And because there were no predators out there, it didn't need to have the same mass that it had. And so you can see that it kind of shrank down in size. And then, you know, as the islands became a little bit drier and as water became more scarce and as, you know, the island probably became overgrazed because of the mammoths, um, the mammoth died out around 12,900 years ago. And you may recall that the oldest human remains were 13,000 years ago. So there was a moment there where it looks like the humans and the mammoths overlap. Uh, there's no archeological evidence that the, that the, the Shumash uh, hunted the mammoths, but it's just interesting that they overlapped in time. Um, here's a view just out towards Carrington Point. And then there are still wild, not wild, there's still horses out there from the ranching era that were just allowed to uh, finish out their lives. Uh, so as you continue um, around the North Shore, you drop down into Lobo Canyon and um, Santa Rosa is like in some ways frustrating because there was, you know, 100 years of cattle grazing that it's like 80, 90 percent grassland. And there's a lot of you're just road walking through grassland. But when you drop down into a canyon like Lobo Canyon um, and you get down into this forest area, it's just mind blowing. It's like, wow, this is like probably what it looked like, you know, back in the day. Uh, and it's it's really it's it's compelling and it's inspiring. <laughs> And there's water down there, which is kind of cool. Um, so some of the plants that are going in there is Toyon, uh, cottonwood, mugwort. You know, some of the plants you'd see, the creek leaks down to the ocean. Um, I forget how far it is, but it's it's like a, enough of a distance that you're hiking through the canyon and you've forgotten about all the grassland and ranch roads that you're walking on and you're just having this immersive experience in a canyon. And then you even forget that you're on an island almost. And then bam, you pop out and you're like, whoa, the ocean. Um, so it's a pretty magical canyon. I would definitely recommend it even just as a day hike. Uh, it's a little bit of a haul from Water Canyon to get over there and back, but you can do it as a day hike. And sometimes um, there's a, I've actually seen a van where um, they take a van out there and give people a ride and do a docent hike. Um, so I hitched a ride one time um, and then ran out to Carrington Point on the way back on my own and hiked back the rest of the way just to take advantage of the extra time. Um, so there's no beach camping at Lobo Canyon. Uh, but it's a half mile uh, west along the shore, if you will, not really the shore, but here up up on the, the bluffs over to Cow Canyon. And this is the mouth of Cow Canyon. And then this is where the, the creek sort of like starts to make its way towards the ocean. And so you're supposed to camp above the high tide line, but if that is unsafe, then you, you can um, find a place that is safe to camp. Uh, Island Fox. So uh, I'd been out in Cal Canyon before and I knew that there was like some better water upstream. Um, so if you head up Cal Canyon, maybe a quarter mile, you'll find a place where, you know, it's actually flowing and it kind of pools up. And this is really, I think the best place to get water uh, in Cal Canyon is decent water. That pool you saw in um, Lobo Canyon, that's also a good spot. Um, did see some little frog when I was there one time. Surprised to see banana slugs uh, two of the times I was out there on Santa Rosa. And then uh, for the hike I did, so I camped at Cow Canyon the first night and then I went back up Lobo Canyon and was um, traversed the island over Black Mountain to get to the South Shore. So I went back up through Lobo Canyon, took more pictures because it's a really scenic place and then crossed the road and then started following what was uh, supposedly an old Jeep road, which it sort of was, but it kind of been used so, so infrequently um, that it was now down to a single track trail. And really the, the heaviest traffic pattern was the Fox the foxes, like you could tell this was a fox route. And it uh, follows the, basically the ridge between Lobo, the drainage for Lobo Canyon and Cow Canyon, um, and gets you all the way up to the ridge that is where Black Mountain is and kind of loops around a little bit and pops up into this, this nice forest of oaks. 
And then from there, you can tie into, um, I think this is Soledad Road, and work your way up into the, the higher parts of the island. And so part of my intention was to, you know, go from the south shore, uh, the north shore to the south shore, just to kind of, you know, connect up some sites, but also try to hit the highest point of the island as a way of kind of keeping in the spirit of that traverse. Um, and as, as I was hiking, I was starting to think like, you know, hey, I'm on this, I think it's Soledad Road, and I know there's wreck road that goes to the south shore, and I wonder if there's some shortcut way to get there, because it's not on the National Geographic map. And then I was really kind of pleasantly surprised to see that there is this uh, Quinn Knob Trail that ties the two together, uh, which is really convenient if you didn't want to do the longer hike that I did. Um, this is a National Ge Geographic map. I put this in here. Um, I drew on the, the Quinn Knob Trail, uh, but you can see it kind of ties in to Wreck Road that would take you over to the Ford Point, uh, whereas I kind of looped wider to get to Soledad Peak and uh, Tag Radar Peak and come down towards, uh, it should be La Jolla, but I don't know why they call it Jolla Vieja Canyon, um, where I camped the second night. So Radar Mountain is, there used to be radar there. It used to be an Air Force base at Johnson's Lee. Um, and there was a paved road from Radar Mountain down to Johnson Lee. And so I actually was on a paved road for part of my backpacking trip. And <clears throat> this is actually the last photo from the that day of hiking because uh, ironically, when I did this hike, I was concerned about running out of water and being dehydrated and being in, exposed to the sun all day because, you know, there's not a lot of tree cover on the island. Um, but it turns out it, it fogged up to a drizzle. Um, and this was like the last clear area I was. And by the time I turned down the trail that leads down to La Jolla Vieja Canyon, uh, I was actually leaning forward in a headwind and being drizzled on and just getting soaked. And I didn't have any rain gear. Um, and I actually did the last mile or so in the dark, which is the headlamp. And I was fortunate that I'd hiked it before as a day hike, you know, five years earlier. So at least I kind of had a feel for what it was. And the trail was definitely more overgrown. And then I get down to where I'm going to camp by La Jolla Vieja Canyon. And as I crest over the little rise, it takes you down to the beach. I hear elephant seals. And when I'd been there five years ago, there were no elephant seals. And I was like, oh, no, there's elephant seals on the beach. I can't camp there. This is like that beach. Um, so I'm like, well, I'll cross the creek and maybe I'll, I'll beach camp on the other side. So I cross to the other side and there's more elephant seals. In fact, they're like, they're like on the road. This is from the next morning. Um, so then I was kind of at a loss to what to do. It was already like, you know, almost nine o'clock and I didn't really feel like hiking to the next uh, available place, which was been like two more miles. Um, so I just had to improvise and find a spot that was close to the beach, but, you know, not up in the brush or anything because you don't want to, you, know, you don't want to damage native vegetation. Um, because the place was kind of close to the beach, I also wanted to make sure that elephant seals had never actually been there before because I didn't want them coming there in the middle of the night. And then because of this weird storm that, that came in that wasn't even, you know, when I checked the weather wasn't there, uh, there were like really strong winds from the east. And so I had to get like four big boulders and hold my tent down. And then in the morning I got up and went a little ways up La Jolla Vieja Canyon uh, to find some water, did find some halfway decent water. And then for some reason, I ambitiously decided to hike, day hike over to Johnson's Lee. Um, I'm going to leave that part out just in the interest of time. But uh, I was surprised to see more elephant seals. So that was kind of cool. And then, you know, uh, grabbed my pack and then continued on to Ford Point. Um, when I was there in 2013, the road wasn't blocked off like it is now. It's not really blocked off, if you will. But um, that, that's for the rangers to not drive any further than this point. They actually were able to drive all the way out to Johnson's Lee, but now I guess they stop at this point because the road was damaged during some winter storms. In 2013, when I went out there, this was a great place to get water in Wreck Canyon. This was like the best resource for Ford Point. And I was surprised, you know, five years later to see that it was just choked up with cattails, that there was no place to get water, uh, which was just a, like an important reminder that you really do need to like check in with the rangers and get a feel for what the water conditions are and find out what you can online and talk to people and um, you know, know what your water situation is gonna be. This is a turn off down to Ford Point. And Ford Point, it's a little hard to see in this photo, but there's this curving you know, beach here with a rock outcrop and then another curving beach past it. And you can find like a place above the high tide line on both of those beaches to camp. And this is the, the second section that I was talking about. Uh, there's a little trail that hops between the two. 
And then here's where I camped at this mouth of this little creek. I mean, it was a dry creek. So this was a great spot to camp uh, just because it was definitely, you know, way above the water line. And then from here, there's a trail that kind of goes up above, um, traces a sand dune. This is looking back west across the two beaches at Ford Point, if you will. Um, and then this drops you up over into uh, San Augustine Canyon. And there's, you can find a place to, to camp there as well. And then from San Augustine Canyon, the trail climbs up um, on the, starts out on the western side of the canyon and crosses over to the eastern side of the canyon and makes its way up to um, San Pablo Road. And there was one crossing. I don't remember how far up it was now. I didn't, I forgot to write that down, but there was like some pooling of water there. Uh, so the trail makes its way up to the ridge. It does pass a, an airplane wreck. I put this in here because these guys were actually out on the island to poach the elk that had been introduced and their plane crashed and you know they walked back over to the ranch house to get a get back to the mainland if you will and kind of pleaded like oh engine trouble um, and then they came back to recover their plane and the, the cattle on the island had eaten all the canvas off of it so there was nothing to recover so they just left it there. This is the top of the trail to San Augustine um, from San Pablo Road. And then this is Clap Spring. So this is actually your best water resource for the South Shore. And this is from 2013, but there are now a bunch of signs that say, you know, don't drink this water. Uh, but on the National Parks website, it does list this as a water source, but it recommends filtering it, which you know, makes sense because if you have a filter, then just filter. Uh, just another map showing what it is. Uh, so San Augustine, the trail is not shown on this National Geographic map, but you come up, you pass Clap Spring, and then you tie into Wreck Canyon Road and make your way over to Water Canyon Campground. Um, it can be windy on Santa Rosa, so they have these uh, windbreak shelters. There are 15 sites on um, Santa Rosa, and uh, I didn't mention this, but this is actually true of Anacapa and Santa Cruz and San Miguel. They all have these metal boxes where you need to store your food because um, foxes are, are very, um, they just know that you have food and they're going to find it and they're going to take it. And the ravens are also uh, equally uh, knowledgeable about the fact that you're bringing food. And then there's also mice on uh, the islands. Um, so you're going to want to use these boxes to store anything you don't want anyone chewing on or taking from you. Um, I was out there one time when it rained. So these shelters actually were kind of helpful. They cut um, some, some of the wind driven rain. There, again, there is there is water at Water Canyon Campground. It's tank water, um, and there's also uh, uh, bathrooms there, so it's actually you know a pretty nice place. This is the mouth of Water Canyon at the beach, pretty scenic area. Uh, a hike if you stay at Water Canyon, I definitely recommend recommend going out to the Torrey Pines because it's not that far. I think it's like four miles round trip, and it's just a it's a a good day hike to do. Um, and then you get. <clears throat> there's a loop trail that goes up and you can wander around in the Torrey Pines. Uh, these can only be found on this one part of Santa Rosa Island and in like the Torrey Pine uh, State Preserve north of San Diego. These are the only two places where they grow. They used to cover a lot more area, uh, but then, you know, as California became, um, you know, as the, as the climate changed, they could only hang out in these, these two areas. Uh, the Chumash name for Santa Rosa is Wima, which means redwood driftwood, because this is one of the places where they really did find a lot of redwood driftwood that they could use to make tamal. So, you know, that became a significant resource. So the last island we're going to visit here is San Miguel. And uh, they were the, San Miguel and Santa Rosa were the last two to separate. This is heading out to San Miguel. San Miguel has a very low profile of an island. There's not... Um, there's not a, a lot of, there's no, there's no trees actually. There's not, it's not a forested island. It's just got chaparral and a lot of grassland. Um, the Chumash word for this island is Tucan. There's no translation that, that's known. Uh, when you come into uh, San Miguel, you come into the beach here. Um, there is no landing pier. Uh, the other three islands all have landing piers, so it's pretty convenient. Uh, for San Miguel, they actually raft you in. You know, they take you, um, they just kind of ferry you in on these rafts. Rafts, that's not the right word, skiffs, these little skiffs, like a, a rubber a rubber boat you can take like six people at a time. Uh, so they do beach landings. And then you can sort of see like 
uh, the trail that goes <clears throat> from the beach up up the canyon up to the campground. Just another shot of the beach looking out towards Prince Island. Um, and then this is coming up that little canyon. And then you get to the campground. There's also wind blocks here on San Miguel. There's nine sites that are available. There is no water on San Miguel, so you have to bring your own water for the entire time you're there. There's no water resource on the island. Uh, a rule of thumb is you might want to think about like a gallon a day as your water usage. So that's how much water you want to bring. Um, you also, you know, you have to pack out all your trash and everything. This is true of all the islands. You have to pack out all your trash. Um, a little tip here, because you're cooking your own food, right? Is a uh, paper towel is a great way to clean some, some dishes without using water. So that's a little water conservation tip for you guys. Um, these windbreaks are, are helpful because both uh, Santa Rosa and San Miguel are west enough that they don't really benefit as much from the windbreak, the natural windbreak of Point Conception. So it's just a lot windier out there. Um, the first time I was out on San Miguel, there was like just a steady constant wind, like a low breeze just coming from the Northeast. Like the entire time I was there, I was kind of fogged in. The second time I was there, it kind of let up a little bit, but it was still, it can just be windy. So these windbreaks really do make a difference. There's a monument to Cabrillo on San Miguel. This is the island that he visited when he did <clears throat> uh, his uh, expedition or his survey of the area. Uh, that was in 1542. He was commissioned by the vice Viceroy of Spain to sail up the California coast. He was ultimately looking for the, the Northwest Passage. He made it far north as uh, Reyes Point and turned around, and, well, not he, but the expedition turned around and came back. Um, Cabrillo died on the expedition. Um, they're two different stories, you know, both involving like breaking a limb and, you know, having it go uh, gangrene on him and, and dying. Um, one is that he was attacked by natives on San Catalina while getting off a boat. And the other was that he just broke his, um, it was his ankle at San Miguel. So this, this was the first uh, Spanish contact into the area. <clears throat> At the time of the Spanish arrival, there were about 22,000 Chumash people in, in the Tri-County area, 3,000 on the island. And this was really a, a turning point in history um, because with the arrival of the Spanish and particularly the mission system, you know, was the arrival of Western diseases. Um, so Cabrillo was 1542, but the Portola expedition was the one that really set th more things in motion. And so that was still like 150 years away. So at least there was that little bit of grace uh, before, um, you know, things, uh, things went uh, worse. So the Portola expedition 769 was a land expedition that came out of uh, Baja California and um, they were looking for a route through California and also at the same time surveying places to put the missions. And the mission system was really the thing that um, decimated the Chumash. Um, I mean, in addition to the diseases, the purpose of the mission was to assimilate the native people and by assimilate meaning like separate them from their culture and assimilate them into, you know, the Spanish culture. Um, the mission system really didn't hold the Chumash in high esteem, kind of saw them as children, used them as a labor resource. And the mission system continued all the way until, well, until 1833. Um, so. California was part of Spain until the, the Mexican War of Independence. And then uh, like 12 years after Mexican independence, the Mexican government secularized the mission. At one time, the missions controlled about a sixth of the land in California. And so the Mexican government decided that, you know, the, mission, the, the church had too much land and too much power. And so they secularized the mission and took that land and um, distributed a lot of it through Mexican land grants. And then another significant moment was the Mexican-American War, which sort of was precipitated by, um, you know, events in Texas, but also the discovery of gold in California um, kind of, you know, drove the need to have the Americans want to like, you know, claim, claim this area. Um, but one of the things that happened in that treaty is that the U.S. government said it would recognize the Mexican land grants, it would honor those. Uh, so that land still stayed in the ownership of, you know, the, the Mexican families that um, either acquired it or granted it. And then 
you know, as economic times changed, a lot of that land got sold to, you know, uh, the Yankees, if you will, at that time. And so that's how a lot of this ranch land ended in the hands of uh, people, you know, from the United States. Uh, I think about the mission, like <clears throat> if there was one ideal quality that they might've tried to hold was the idea that they were holding the land in trust for the native people. Like that was something they'd sort of stated, but the minute secularization happened, that ended that, that you know, sliver of like noble purpose, not that it was ever realized. Um, and then just a quick history of the <clears throat> Channel Islands National Park. Um, Anna Kappa and Santa Barbara Islands were recognized as Channel Islands National Monument back in 1938. Um, so that was like sort of the, you know, the embryo, if you will, of the national parks. And then in 1963, the, the Navy reached an agreement with the, the Interior Department to have the national parks manage San Miguel. And then in 78, Santa Cruz Island was sold to the Nature Conservancy. Um, so that ended the ranching uh, era there. And in 1980, uh, Channel Islands National Park was created uh, or designated. And then in 1986, Santa Rosa Island was purchased by the National Park. Um, ranching was allowed to continue until 1998, and the families living out there were able to allowed to live till 2012. Live there until 2012. Uh, from 1991 to 1996, Eastern Santa Cruz Island, those things east of the Montañón Ridge, were acquired in different uh, portions by the National Park. And then in 2000, the isthmus, the place between Montañón and where the Nature Conservancy land now begins was actually generously donated by the Nature Conservancy. And so at that point, that's when the island, that Channel Islands National Park looks like it does today. Anyway, so back to San Miguel, we're on the last island. We're gonna wrap it up as, as quickly as I can here. So there are three hikes that you can do on San Miguel and all of them are docent led hikes. So the only thing you can do by yourself on San Miguel is, is walk along the, the beach down here, uh, uh, Kyler Harbor and up, you know, up and back down from the campground. Uh, the docents are, uh, this is true of all the islands where you go on a docent hike, they're all very knowledgeable. You know, they're either the ranger or someone from Channel Islands Nationalist Corps, uh, and they just have a lot of great information. So the three hikes you can do on the islands um, are the one out to Cargill Point, one out to Harrison Point, Harris Point, and then one out to Point Bennett, which is the long one, which kind of embodies a traverse. So this is one out to uh, Cardwell Point. And you can see uh, the western end of Santa Rosa over there. Kind of a close up shot of that. And really the, the main site out here at Cardwell Point, and Cardwell Point's actually behind you, but you're looking down onto this beach, is you get to see the elephant seals, like they're almost there um, in, the, in the summer, fall, when, when it's uh, easy to go out to the islands. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that, um, Island Packers has regular boat trips out to Anacapa and Santa Cruz year round, uh, but they have less frequent boat rides out to Santa Rosa and particularly San Miguel. And they don't have boat rides from like November to February because the sea is just rougher the further west out you get. Um, so usually the times that you'd head out to San Miguel is the same time that the elephant seals are out there. Elephant seals spend just 10% of their life on the land. And they come out April through August to molt, like shed their skin, like you see this guy down here um, shedding his skin. And then December through March, they'll come out to breed. And it's not like they're out there for that whole chunk of time. That's just, they come out in different waves to do that. Um, elephant seals were actually hunted to almost extinction in the late 1800s. They were hunted for their blubber that was rendered into oil for lamps. And <clears throat> there were only like about 40 to 100 of them left on Guadalupe Island. I'll show you where that is in relationship to the islands. Um, but they've recovered significantly. There's like, you know, close to 200,000 elephant seals now. And they can be found on San Miguel, Santa Rosa and Santa Barbara Island. And often they'll be out here as part of their mating also like um, sparring. Uh, this is the hike up to Harris Point. Um, what's cool about Harrison Point uh, is just a lot of great plants. You're just gonna see like a lot of great plants and great views back out towards the harbor. And then the view out towards Harris Point is kind of epic as well. So that one's mostly about the views. Uh, Cardwell Point is about three, uh, six miles round trip and Harris Point is about three miles round trip. So you could conceivably do, conceivably do both of those in one day. Sometimes they offer one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, and then the big hike 
out to uh, Point Bennett is, is 14 miles round trip. And those might sound like big miles, but somehow the miles on the islands go by a little quicker. And there's not a lot of elevation gain loss, particularly out to Point Bennett. So it's not that, it's not that hard of a hike in that sense. It's just long. Um, so this is heading out to Point Bennett. And one of the sites along uh, the trail out to Point Bennett is the Caliche Forest. And these are actually like mineral casts of conifer trunks from trees that grew on the island during the last ice age. And you might remember the white sandy beaches that you saw in those photos uh, at San Miguel, and there's even some on San, Santa Rosa. Um, why we have white sandy beaches here, and these are actually the northernmost sandy beaches in North America. You know, you'd normally see these more in the Car Caribbean, you know, like the tropical and subtropical areas. <clears throat> and what creates those white sandy beaches is, uh, you know, um, the dying off of uh, shell life, you know, in the ocean. Like, so it's the mineral deposit of those sea creatures. And why we don't have white sandy beaches on the coast is there's an inflow of eroded material from the creeks um, that come in that have like quartz and feldspar and has a darker color. And they're just, there's not enough waterways on the island to introduce that material. So the dominant material is this carbonite material. And what happens is it can get, this sand can get blown in and form a cast around the tree. And then as the tree dies, that cast is still, still there and it, it gets rained on, that mineral kind of percolates in and replaces the, the root system and the tree system you know, of the dead tree. And so then it makes these casts so it's kind of like some people call it like a ghost forest, uh, but it is cool because it's it's uh, evidence that there there was actually these the forests on the island. This is kind of a view, just what it looks like heading out towards Point Bennett. You can kind of see like this is what you're going to see in terms of plant is is a uh, lupin and uh, cowdy brush and you know this kind of uh, more shrub like cover. Uh, put this in here because like on uh, I think on all the islands, but particularly on San Miguel, they do a census each year of the foxes, and they also do a census of like the lizards. The lizard senses is they'll put a board down, um, like a big piece of plywood, and the, the lizards will go underneath that and they'll flip it over and count how many are there and kind of make some guesstimates based on, you know, square mileage and how many they found and density and that kind of stuff. But the foxes, they'll actually capture them and weigh them and take a blood sample and all this kind of stuff. And what they bait these uh, traps with is cat food. And so the fox will come in to get that cat food and then the, the thing will close and they'll spend the night. And then, you know, they'll do their little census count, get the information and release the fox. Uh, but some of the older foxes on San Miguel have figured this out. And so they'll actually, they don't mind getting caught a second time to get some cat food because they know they're going to be released anyways. So they've actually figured out how to game the system. And I think that's kind of cool that the foxes are like, hey, you know, I just got to spend a night in a cage, but I get free cat food. So, okay. Um, so I think it's cool that the, the foxes are that smart. So the trail eventually gets out to Point, uh, point Bennett. And... Um, you can actually see six different species of pinnipeds out here. You can see the California sea lion, the northern elephant seal, harbor seals, and northern fur seals, which all actually will hang out here. And then sometimes the stellar sea lion and Guadalupe fur seal will, will visit this island. And so you really, this is the massive amount of um, pinnipeds that you're going to get to see on this island, in this part of the island. <clears throat> I put this in here just so where Guadalupe Island is in relationship to the Channel Islands. So that's where the last hold, stronghold of the um, northern elephant seals were. And this is also where the Guadalupe fur seal comes from. Um, so you see it's like significant distance that these, these seals can cover. Just some of the, the sea lions and the elephant seals. And then this is actually the last slide. Um, this is just the westernmost part of San Miguel and therefore the westernmost part of the Northern Channel Islands and Santa Rosé, when it was one big island extended like another 12 miles past this. Um, so here's just some resources, the uh, Channel Islands website, that's just a great resource. You know, it's where down here you can get all these interpreter brochures. Oh, look, my, my little pointer works finally. Um, and then Island Packers, that's a great resource. Channel Islands Restoration does uh, uh, restoration work on the islands. You can do some volunteer work with them. So I put them in here as a resource. And then just my blog um, has the articles I wrote when I went out there. And plus the articles I write for backcountry <clears throat> treks in our national forest and upcoming talks and events and all that kind of stuff. So now we can take some questions. Sorry for running over here, everybody, but I want to make space for questions because that's a lot of information and four islands is a lot of places to visit.
Yes. No, thank you, James. That was very, very informative. Appreciate all the photos. Um, if it gives you that sense that, you know, you're, you're there, right. In a way. Yep. Um, and uh, I just, there's, there's some questions actually that, that did come up. So I'm going to lump the questions in together. Cause a lot of them are, some of them are very connected. Uh, there were a few questions on uh, poison Oak. Um, any on any of the islands? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of drawing a blank. So I'm going to say there is poison oak on the islands. Um, I know there's not on Anacapa and it's probably not on, uh, I know there's not on Anacapa, let's just say that. Uh, I don't remember being a big hazard if it is there. Uh, I feel a little embarrassed that I can't remember whether it's there or not. Um, but it's not like in our local backcountry where you're really like fighting the brush. Um, most of the trails that you're going to be uh, hiking on are more grasslandy or you know shrub so um, that's one of the things that makes it a little bit easier travel on the islands um, typically when you're on the main trails is that they're just not they're not overgrown so it doesn't take that long <coughs> and a lot of them are old ranch roads so i think it's easier to make better time on the islands but that's what i mean like doing like a 14 mile day actually isn't isn't as hard on the islands as it is as it would be on the mainland i've just noticed Okay, sweet. There were a couple questions on uh, snakes. Oh, but but related to this, there are no snakes on the island. Okay, that's what I was say. There was the snakes. No rattlesnakes, no snakes okay. of any kind. There's no bears or coyotes or mountain lions. There's like no predators. It's like, it's uh, somewhat paradisical, right? When you're hiking, it's like, you're not really worried about like, is there a snake out there? Is there a bear out there? It's like, we're I mean, not like I worry about that anyways, but you know, it's uh, it's more relaxing in that sense. I mean, those foxes are adorable. Like, yeah. they just look yeah, so that, adorable. that's your biggest menace is the foxes. <laughs> um, someone's asking about spotted skunks. There are spotted skunks out there, um, not on Anacapa, but on um, Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa and maybe San Miguel. Um, I think I seen one one time at night. They're, they're nocturnal, so, you know, that's why I don't have any photos of them, even if I had seen one. Um, yeah, so the mammals that are still on the islands, if you will, is uh, the island fox, the spotted skunk, and the mouse. Those are the ones that are still there. Uh, and I, maybe still there is not the right way to say that because they're the ones that have always been there. Um, what's not there is the cows and the elks and the deer and, you know, all the introduced mammals. Um, is someone was asking about the, a detailed map of Santa Rosa that you were showing that they couldn't find. Is it possible? Um, is there a good resource that you can recommend or so, is it so that, sites? So the detailed map specifically of Santa Rosa was on the National Parks website. Okay. I just found that a couple of days ago. And then down here, the Channel Islands, uh, the National Geographic map of the Channel Islands is pretty good. That one I had a couple pictures of. So this map without the arrows and notes <clears throat> is on the Channel Islands National Parks website. Um, if you go to things to do and do hiking, um, it'll be listed as one of the options of a, a thing you could download, like an interpretive hike, of the interpreter brochures that I listed. Um, this is where you can find this detailed map. So it is on the Channel Islands National Park website. Sweet. And then um, this, I guess, might be the final question here. Um, that someone mentioned, you'd mentioned that the islands are still rising. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, the transverse mountains are still, you know, being uplifted. So they are gaining like a couple of millimeters a year. Um, you know, they're also being eroded by wind and whatnot. Um, but yeah, they are still rising. Sweet. I'd give it a, anyone has any other questions? I was up sure like I had a list, but I mean, it's, uh, we were in a little over, but it was good that you went over because there's a, a lot of info there. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you another 30 seconds. If anyone has any other additional questions, we could pop in here. You well, did cover a lot of ground today, James. <laughs> literally, right? <laughs> um, sweet. Okay. So with that, um, just, a, just a heads up to everyone that's still here. Just a, the next trail talks that we have scheduled on the calendar is um on thursday the 16th the so this june 16th 
And that one is uh, building a comprehensive trails plan for Santa Barbara County, where, what, how, and who with Ray Ford. You can still register for that on the library's website. And then uh, on the calendar as well, July 21st, we have the um, Tahoe Rim Trail Overview and Sustainable Trail Use with Morgan Steele and Tommy uh, Rosenblitz. Um, and that's what is upcoming there. Uh, James. But also, thank you. I know you're battling a cold there, and it, <laughs> we, I just want to say we appreciate you being able to do this talk today. Um, thanks, Ahmad, and, and yeah, thanks to the library for, for hosting all this great content that's available to the public for free and um, being just a huge resource for people to um, learn more about what's going on in our local area. And um, there are some, you know, resources that the library does have because if there was a book on the islands that it would be there <clears throat> well and the island visions book is kind of a cool book so island um, Visions book is really cool if you don't have you've seen it check it out we have at the library um you can see more illustrations of those adorable foxes in there so <laughs> this is a good little section on them um but no really appreciate your your presentation james uh, one of these days i'm gonna make it out there and i want to go with you so <laughs> if you do a hike out there and a group hike definitely let us know uh we can get this news out there see if there's there's there seems like there might be some interest in the community if that's even possible yeah, yeah and and not to plug my blog but if you go to songs of the wilderness.com you can um sign up to get on the email list that way for any upcoming stuff i'm doing and uh what that really means is you can you know have a way to contact me also um you know if you need information about the islands or <clears throat> want to know if i have a class coming up or something that's like the easiest way to get in touch with me Perfect. Well, I'll respect everyone's time here. Thank you all to attended who's still here. And thank you very much, James. All right. Thanks, everybody.